about uh, Professor Craig. Professor Craig is a research professor of philosophy at the Talbot School of Theology at Biola University and also a professor of philosophy at Houston Baptist University. Um, he has authored or edited over 30 books, including the Kalam Cosmological Argument, Assessing the New Testament Evidence for the Historicity of the Resurrection of Jesus, Divine for Knowledge and Human Freedom, Ism, Atheism, and Big Bang Cosmology, and God, Time, and Eternity, as well as over 800 articles in professional journals of philosophy and theology, including the Journal of Philosophy, New Testament Studies, Journal for the Study of the New Testament, American Philosophical Quarterly, Philosophical Studies, Philosophy, and British Journal for Philosophy of Science. In 2016, Dr. Craig was named by the best schools as one of the most 50 most influential living philosophers. Um, so I'm honored to uh, introduce him to you. And please, without further ado, Professor Craig. And I also have a handout of the response. I'll pass it around. Thank you very much. It's an honor to have uh, my book, God Overall, selected as the topic of this session at the Eastern Division APA meeting this year, and a special privilege to have such prominent critics as Peter Van Inwagen, today's most prominent Platonist metaphysician, and Greg Welty, today's most prominent divine conceptualist. Their criticisms are bracing and serve to advance the discussion. God Overall is a popular distillation of my larger book, God and Abstract Objects, published in 2017 by Schwinger Verlag. Its expanded discussion includes additional anti-realist responses to Platonism, such as Charles Chihara's and Jeffrey Hellman's paraphrastic strategies. Since most of you will doubtless not have read God Overall. Let me take a step back and give you a panoramic view of my project. My aim is to defend the doctrine of divine aseity, that is to say, the view that God is, in Brian Lefdow's helpful phrase, the sole ultimate reality, against what I take to be the most serious challenge to that doctrine, namely Platonism the view that there are uncreated abstract objects. I make it clear that I'm talking about metaphysically heavyweight Platonism, which takes abstract objects to be as real as the fundamental particles that make up the physical world, not a lightweight Platonism, which takes abstract objects to be merely semantic objects, not objects in the ordinary sense. In the book, I offer a taxonomy of positions on the existence of mathematical objects, figure one, on the handout. I choose mathematical objects as my paradigm example, rather than abstract objects in general, because the taxonomy then makes clear, as Greg remarks, that there are realist, as well as anti-realist versions of anti-Platonism and because the center of gravity in the debate over abstract objects lies in the philosophy of mathematics. I take it that in our session today, we have two realist views of mathematical objects represented. For the rest, the taxonomy reveals a panoply of non-Platonist alternatives, such as Penelope Maddy's Ah Realism, Jody Azuni's Neutralism, Hartree Fields, fictionalism, Richard Routley's neo minongianism Mary Lang's pretense theory, and so on and so forth. I find that Christian philosophers are generally unfamiliar with these non-Platonist alternatives, so that these views tend to be overlooked. For example, in his massive book, God and Necessity, Brian Lefdow never mentions these other anti-realist alternatives to Platonism until the book's final paragraph on page 551. It is my goal in the book not to foreclose 
but to open up various alternatives to Platonism. I want realist alternatives like absolute creationism and conceptualism to succeed. So Greg is quite right in seeing me as an ally in this venture. I have not offered knockdown arguments against conceptualism, but expressed worries that I hope will motivate Christian philosophers to look more seriously at anti-realist alternatives, which I at least find far more plausible. Indeed, I can imagine some future philosopher remarking, William Lane Craig never met an anti-realism which he didn't like. It's important to understand that my anti-Platonism is theologically motivated. I do not suggest that Platonism is philosophically untenable. I think that the general consensus among philosophers of mathematics is that all of these views are controversial, and that therefore no one can justifiably claim that his is the correct view. Rather, my conviction is that Platonism is theologically untenable. I thus come to this discussion with the theologically based conviction that Platonism is untenable. The question then is, how best to defeat any arguments for Platonism? It intrigued me that Peter also comes to the table with a deep presumption against Platonism, though in his case philosophically, not theologically motivated. He takes it that abstract and concrete objects are so utterly dissimilar that it is preferable to assume that one of these categories is empty. Since we know that concrete objects exist, we should presume that abstract objects do not exist. Now, as I say, for Van Inwagen, this presumption is very deep. He says, one should not believe in abstract objects unless one feels rationally compelled by some weighty consideration or argument. A philosopher should wish not to be a Platonist if it's rationally possible for the informed philosopher not to be a Platonist. Now, to my mind, and I'm sure in the minds of most philosophers, the debate ends right there. For there is no rationally compelling argument for Platonism or any of the alternatives we have mentioned. One argues at best for the rational tenability of one's favorite view. Indeed, Van Inwagen has himself expressed such an understanding of doing metaphysics. No one, he says, is in a position to be confident about the answers to these questions. But perhaps Peter exaggerates the strength of the anti-Platonist presumption. What overriding argument for Platonism is there? The only serious argument for Platonism is the indispensability argument. Now, the original Quine Putnam version of the indispensability of the argument is dead. It is that version of the argument that Peter has explicitly rejected. But that is not the contemporary version with which I'm concerned. Mark Balaguer provides the following stripped-down version of the argument on the handout. One, if a simple sentence, that is a sentence of the form A is F or A is R related to B or whatever, is literally true, then the objects that its singular terms denote exist. Likewise, if an existential sentence is literally true, then there exist objects of the relevant kinds. For example, if there is an F is true, then there exist some Fs. Two, there are literally true simple sentences containing singular terms that refer to things that could only be abstract objects. Likewise, there are literally true existential statements whose existential quantifiers range over things that could only be abstract objects. Three, therefore, abstract objects exist. Now, it seems to me that Peter affirms this argument, or something very like it. One, expresses his criterion of ontological commitment. 
we can leave aside the use of singular terms, if desired, and focus on existential quantification, as he has done today. Two expresses his conviction that no paraphrases are available that get rid of the quantification over abstract objects. Thus, one is stuck with abstract objects. In the book, I try to show that both of the premises can be undercut if not refuted, and thus the conclusion is defeated. Now, Peter declines to respond to my attempts to <laughs> undercut one, not to mention two, because, he says, he understands very little of what I say. Moreover, he says that I have grossly misunderstood him. In short, he doesn't understand me, and I don't understand him. This is a fine kettle of fish. <laughs> well, on the basis of his explanations today, let me try once again to understand him. <laughs> Reading what he said today, the thought occurred to me that maybe he isn't really offering a criterion of ontological commitment after all. Maybe he's not saying that you are ontologically committed to the values of the variables bound by the first order existential quantifier in sentences you take to be true. Maybe he's saying merely that one should not make contradictory claims, like there is no x such that x is an abstract object, and there is an x such that x is a sentence type. Even if one has an ontologically lightweight interpretation of the existential quantifier, still, one shouldn't make such claims. But that can't be the whole story. <coughs> of course, philosophers such as neutralists and neo minongians who deny that the quantifier carries heavyweight uh, existence uh, uh, commitments will generally agree that one should not make even lightweight contradictory claims, but they will explain that there is no contradiction because these quantificational claims are neutral <coughs> and so can be used in a lightweight or a heavyweight sense. As Peter would put it, they can be used to express different propositions. So, reconsider Ayer's claim that, and I quote, it makes sense to say, in a case where someone is believing, that there is something that he believes. But it does not follow from this that something must exist to be believed in the way that something must exist to be eaten or to be struck. Peter's claim that Ayer's words involve a glaring apparent contradiction is purchased only at the expense of ignoring Ayer's full claim, which is not even apparently contradictory. What Ayer said was that, quote, it makes sense to say in a case in which someone is believing that there is something that he believes, but it does not follow from this that something must exist to be believed in the way that something must exist to be eaten or to be struck. The first sentence is a lightweight, quantificational claim. The second is a heavyweight existence assertion. You can get a contradiction only by assuming that the first order existential quantifier carries heavy ontological commitments, which is exactly what Peter has elsewhere affirmed, but what neutralists and neo-minongians deny. So, Peter is not saying just that we shouldn't contradict ourselves. He is saying that the first order quantifier is a device of ontological commitment. But this is a controversial claim. I agree with Jody Azuni that the informal quantifiers of ordinary language are neutral in their ontological commitments. We say things like, there's a lack of compassion in the world, or there's a better way to do that without thinking that we are making ontological commitments or need to offer a paraphrase. Van Inwagen affirms that the first order existential quantifier is no more than an abbreviation of these ordinary language expressions. Accordingly, it ought to be ontologically neutral. Only by assuming that Ayer's quantificational claim involves ontological commitment does 
does give me opining, generate a contradiction where there was none. This was one of my criticisms of the Neoquinian criterion. Far from helping us to notice contradictions, it actually creates them. Peter goes on to affirm the necessity of offering an acceptable paraphrase of the claim, which commits the would-be nominalist to abstract objects, and he expresses his pessimism that this can be done. So it seems to me that Peter is indeed defending an indispensability argument for Platonism. The following seems to be a fair formulation of Van Inwagen's argument presented today. One, if a true simple sentence expresses a proposition involving quantification over certain objects, then we are ontologically committed to those objects. Two, there are true simple sentences which express propositions involving quantification over objects that could only be abstract objects. Three, therefore, we are ontologically committed to abstract objects. What remains to be shown by Van Inwagen is that this argument overcomes the presumption against Platonism and survives defeat by besting every non-Platonist alternative. Now, one of those alternatives is divine conceptualism. I have misgivings about conceptualism, which Welty seeks to allay. This is exactly the sort of response that I hope to elicit from committed conceptualists. I don't claim, but I do worry that Greg's version of conceptualism violates divine aseity because he thinks that God's thoughts exist as uncreated objects which are not identical with God. One issue that needs clarification is the status of divine thoughts. Conceptualism is a form of realism that affirms that divine thoughts are actually existing objects. I myself prefer Peter Van Inwagen's more austere view that we don't really need thoughts as items in our ontology, so we might as well get rid of them. Certainly, a thinking God exists, but we needn't reify his thoughts into existing things. But on conceptualism, God's thoughts do exist and are not identical to God. God is not a thought. What kind of objects, then, are thoughts? Well, they seem to be mental states or mental events of some sort. In that case, it seems to me almost obvious that God is the cause of his thoughts. He is engaged in thinking, and the result is thoughts, just as I produce various thoughts by thinking. If this is right, then there is no threat to divine aseity, since thoughts are dependent beings. However, such a version of conceptualism will affect Greg's handling of the bootstrapping objection, since his response depends on God's not being the cause of his thoughts. But consider Greg's view that God's thoughts are uncreated objects. He suggests two ways to reconcile such a view with divine aseity. First, we take God's thoughts to be necessarily existing parts of God. This would solve the problem. But my reservation about this response is that God's thoughts seem to be neither parts of God, as the Trinitarian persons might be, nor necessarily existing parts. God's thoughts seem to be contingent, in that God is plausibly not thinking about everything he knows. That was the point of another of Oppie's objections to conceptualism. God knows that for any real number r, r is not identical to the Taj Mahal. But is God actually thinking about such a truth? That doesn't seem a plausible account of God's thought life. So I like Greg's second response better. There is just God engaged in thinking, and there's an end on it. <clears throat> yes, but that seems right. And that is, as I maintain, anti-realism, not realism. Next, I do 
continue to worry about conceptualism ascribing to God inappropriate thoughts. Denying that God has such thoughts would be a problem for omniscience only if we think that everything that God knows, he is thinking about. But I know innumerable things that I am not now thinking about. I have no such thoughts at this time. Indeed, in the case of bawdy thoughts, we who are Christians try to put such thoughts out of our mind when they arise. Surely, Greg can see the problem of having God continually thinking about such things. When I was speaking on this topic at Rutgers University, the late Marilyn Adams reminded us that the medievals held that God's thoughts are directed only toward himself, that if he thought of anything else, he would get dirty, so to speak. He knows creatures only insofar as he knows himself as their cause. Since I think that God is temporal since the moment of creation, I have no problem with God's having a stream of consciousness, thoughts which are constantly changing as new events become present. A really significant worry about conceptualism is its privatization of certain propositions. I don't think that Greg has fully grasped the problem. As a personal being, God surely has first-person indexical thoughts. But on conceptualism, if God has any first-person indexical thoughts, then those thoughts are propositions. Since we cannot access God's first-person thoughts, it immediately follows that there are purely private propositions, a most unwelcome conclusion. As Greg says, we want to say that when God has the thought, I am the God of Israel, and we have the thought, Yahweh is the God of Israel, we grasp the same proposition from different perspectives. The thoughts are different, but the propositional content is the same. But on conceptualism, we cannot make such a distinction since God's thoughts just are propositions. It seems to me that the only way out of this problem for the conceptualist is to hold that while all propositions are divine thoughts, not all divine thoughts are propositions. Welty reminds us that he has said this very thing. Quote, it is no part of the conceptualist thesis to say that just any divine thought counts as a proposition. The conceptualist view is more modest than this. A particular range of the uncreated divine thoughts function as abstract objects. Good point. So, on this view, first-person indexical divine thoughts are not propositions, despite their alethicity, that is, truth aptness, and doxasticity, being the objects of doxastic attitudes. But that looks terribly ad hoc to me. So the conceptualist has some more work to do on this score. Well, I'm out of my allotted time, but I want to thank our esteemed commentators once again for their stimulating remarks.